Welcome. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Coleman. I'm a teaching artist at Northern Clay Center and we have resurrected an art history class I taught a decade ago. If you want to do the readings associated with the lectures or to have your students do the readings, our textbooks are Emmanuel Cooper's 10,000 Years of Pottery and Susan Staubach's book, Clay, both of which are still available in print. And the readings that would have been read for today, Lecture 6, The Classic Age of Chinese and Maya Ceramics. And if you want to just listen to the lecture and skip the book, start with the next slide. Before we move to China and the Tang Dynasty, I want to pause for a minute for a really incredible development in ceramic art from Japan. This is from the Kofun period. And this fragment is a bust of a warrior. In Japan during the Grave Mound period from 250 to 600 CE, earthen mounds or tumuli were erected over the graves of the rulers. These were massive mounds and included a surrounding moat. Haniwa, which means circles of clay or circle of clay, were placed in a ring around the mounds to act as guards and companions for the dead. The Haniwa were coil built and due to their size hollow. Once they were in place around the funerary mound, all who approached could see them from a great distance. At the top of the burial mound, in the center, along the edges, and at the entrance of the burial chamber of enormous tombs constructed for the ruling elite during the tumulus period. Formally attired in a breastplate and studded metal helmet, this Haniwa bust of a warrior vividly attests to the world of early Japan. His broad face, triangular nose, and oval perforations for his eyes and mouth evoke an impassive resolve. The earliest Haniwa, dating to the late 3rd century CE, were simple clay cylinders. And we think that they began using them to prevent the mound from eroding. So the cylinders were placed all around the mound and then the moat. Houses and animals, as well as ceremonial and other objects, appeared in the late 4th century, while figural Haniwa were created in the 5th, 6th, and 7th centuries. The cut eyes and mouth, we believe, were both technical and aesthetic. They were meant to be escape valves for the steam during the firing, but they also would present a, a dark space and eyes looking at whoever was approaching the tomb. So they made them better guardians. Figural Haniwa included statues of men, women, fantastical or anthropomorphic animals, houses, boats, and horses. The human Haniwa wore hats, earrings, necklaces, and a sort of knee-length tunic with long sleeves over billowing pants. Some, like the one on the left, were placed on top of a square or cylindrical pedestal, making them even taller and more imposing. On the left, we see a seated female figure in ritual costume, possibly representing a shamaness. And on the right, a Haniwa horse. Moving to the mainland, the Tang Dynasty came about in 617 CE in China. The Han Dynasty had collapsed in 2020 CE with the invasion of Central Asian warriors, or the Huns, China plunged into its, quote, Dark Ages, called the Six Dynasties period, and for a time, trade with Europe and with Western Asia was hampered, though it didn't cease entirely. Knowledge of lead glazing was lost and did not reappear until the Tang Dynasty period. It was during the Tang Dynasty that the art of porcelain was perfected and in the following dynasties it came to dominate. 
Three centuries of the Tang Dynasty were a time of creativity and prosperity. The borders were extended to include Korea, Tibet, and what is now Vietnam, and Eastern Turkestan, and were relatively secure. Extensive international trade was resumed, and an influx of immigrants, including Persians, Turks, Uyghurs, Tibetans, Sogdians, Indians, Greeks, Koreans, and Japanese, brought goods and ideas and commerce. This map is a representation of all of the land and sea trade routes around 870 CE. Buddhism was now widely practiced in China with the heavily populated city of Shang'an becoming a great center of Buddhist culture. In the past, craftsmen were required to produce for the royal court, but now they were monetarily taxed instead and a new class of independent hand workers arose. Crafts and the decorative arts burgeoned, poetry thrived, and tea drinking became an art form. Tea was cultivated in the southwestern part of China by the third century of the Common Era. But during the Tang Dynasty, the cultivation, preparation, and consumption of tea, along with a connoisseurship of the fine cups in which it was served, defined the culture. Tang ceramics reflected the cosmopolitan aspect of this period in China's history. The Tang Dynasty is most known for four types of pottery, sansai or three colored ware made with lead frit imported from the mines in the Near East, porcelain covered with luscious celadons, white on white pottery, and earthenware fired and then painted with polychrome pigments. The ceramic technology that the Tang workshops developed to create these wares was the most advanced in the world at the time and was unknown outside of Asia until centuries later. Here we see some examples of Sansai ware. On the right, a tomb guardian, and in the middle and the left, substitution burial statues of animals important to the Tang. The camel was used on the Silk Road and for trade, and the horse for warfare and polo. Tang potters added powdered iron, copper, antimony, and manganese to their lead glazes to make their famous three colored or sansai ware. In the clean oxidizing fires of their kilns, these metallic oxides turned the pots brilliant browns, greens, yellows, and purples. The most common combination is the brown, yellow, green combination you see here. The lidded jar on the top right is made of earthenware, wheel thrown, with three color resist decoration of stripes and florets that are typical of the ornament on polychrome woven silks of this period. The shape of the jar was favored for burials. In the bottom right, we have an example of a dish molded with applique decoration using only two colors of the lead glaze. And on the left, a tomb figurine from later Tang period when fashionable women were full figured. Lead glaze tomb figures were more expensive, so they were found in royal tombs. Cobalt, which was not discovered in China until hundreds of years later, was imported in small amounts from the Middle East, where it was used to produce a blue the Chinese called Mohammedan blue. In reality, Tang three-colored ware was often more than three colors, because when the glaze melted, it ran together, often creating new colors. On the right, you see a camel, with musicians from the Middle East. A reminder that Tang Dynasty immigrants included Persians, Turks, Tibetans, Indians, Greeks, Koreans, and Japanese. On the right, you can see that there's one musician with the blue cobalt lead glaze and then some stripes of blue. And on the left, the blue melting into the green lead glaze. Sculptures such as these were made of earthenware and painted post-firing. They're known as mingi 
or spirit goods and were placed in tombs to provide for the deceased's needs in the afterlife. Female attendants were generally produced in groups for burial in the tombs of high-ranking women. The equestrian's ensemble on the left consists of a tight-fitting upper garment with a v-neck, narrow sleeves, and a long flaring skirt. Her hat would have been fitted with a veil for traveling in the desert. On the right, these Tang Dynasty dancers represent a continuation of the Han Dynasty sleeve dance. These figures were made with the wet pull technique of forming the bodies and the arms. Under the Tang, the wear from the Yu kilns from the Han Dynasty became more refined until finally a true porcelain body was attained, as you see on the right. At high temperatures in a reducing smoky atmosphere, iron produces a green glaze known as celadon rather than the red or brown glaze it produces in an oxidizing fire. During the Tang Dynasty, potters began using a white colored clay body, frequently porcelain, which clarified the color of the glaze. The green was soft and jade-like, the tint of a spring apple, a pool of mossy water, and on occasion even misty blue, and it inspired numerous Tang poets to describe the celadon. This fine white clay body for the white on white wear is porcelain composed of kaolin, feldspar, and silica that when fired to a temperature of 2300 Fahrenheit or more becomes vitrified and transparent. The fine white clay body was made possible by the discovery of deposits of both the white primary kaolin from the mountain Gailing near Jingjiazhen and the discovery of Badunsa, a white feldspathic rock essential to making porcelain. During high firing, the Badunsa melts and surrounds the particles of kaolin so they can fuse. Official imperial kilns were established in Jingdezhen near deposits of kaolin. The finished ware was shipped by boat to Nanking and then through the Grand Canal to the Imperial Palace in Beijing. We're going to abruptly move to South America here to look at some more stirrup bottles from the area that's now Peru. The uh, culture we're looking at is the mochi or the mochica culture. Mochica ceramics showed a strong sculptural sense. By around 400 CE at their most creative and productive, the talented sculptor potters working in around Mochi on the west coast of present-day Peru, modeled stirrup-spouted bottles into realistic portrait heads. The sculptors formed the face vessels by hand modeling, building with coils, pressing the clay into two-part molds, or using a combination of these methods. To make the spouts, the potter sculptor wrapped strips of clay around wooden rods. When the clay stiffened enough to allow the rods to be removed, but was still pliable, it was bent into the spout shape. Details of the face or body would be added by carving into the clay or adding additional clay to form the features. Age differences appear as well. For instance, wrinkles for age were modeled onto the face before firing. The multiple images produced with this method were often changed sufficiently to create lifelike portraits of individuals. The portrait head bottles were used in rituals and for mortuary events. The faces are painted along the nose bridge, a triangle from nose to mouth, and a larger rectangle on each cheek. This pattern is seen on prominent people and even on major gods in mochi art. Here we have two more stirrup vessels with the spout positioned differently. On the left is a vertical orientated stirrup spout. The globular chamber of this pleasing well-proportioned bottle is shaped to accommodate the undulating body of a big serpent worked in relief on one half of the chamber. The reptile's large head has cat-like eyes, whiskers, and a bifurcated tongue. 
The elegant arch of the spout, which could serve as a handle, thickens toward the juncture with the chamber, and from its center rises its short tapering end. The noble posture of the elegantly dressed man with a grave forward-looking gaze reveals his distinguished position in mochi society. This is the bottle on the right. Sitting cross-legged, a common pose for prominent mochi men, his disproportionately large hands rest on his knees. He wears a plain tunic and armband, and his head is covered with a neatly folded turban, bearing a snarling feline face on the front and a rounded ornament in back. Large, round flares decorate his ears, and the hole in his nose once held an ornament, probably of gold. Also missing are the inlays from his eyes and perhaps from the ear flares. The classical period of Maya ceramics is from 250 to 900 CE. Like other Mesoamerican cultures, the Maya worshiped nature gods and recorded past history in hieroglyphs or glyphs on stone monuments and pottery. They developed an accurate calendar and created impressive stone pyramids and temples in what is now Mexico and Guatemala. According to the Popol Vol, the sacred book of the Quiche Indians in Guatemala, the first human-like creatures were modeled out of clay by the gods. The gods are said to have destroyed these clay people, however, because they could not think. And finally, says the sacred manuscript, only maize was used for the flesh of our first fathers. The ceremonial pottery of the Maya was simple in shape. The potter seemed to be more interested in producing a smooth painting ground than elaborate pottery shapes. The cylindrical vases, such as the one on the right, were often covered with plaster to give the painters a better background on which to compose figurative paintings. The stylized paintings show architecture, priests, warriors, and nobles wearing ornate headdresses and vividly depicting rituals, including the traditional ball game of the Maya. On the right side is a cylindrical vessel with a throne scene. Polychrome ceramic vessels such as this are objects of great beauty, but the painted renditions of Maya myth and courtly life also serve as historical documents. A palace court scene is depicted on the exterior of the cylindrical vessel. An elegant young lord seated on a throne wears a grand feathered headdress and a large collar of beads and pendants. Two seated male figures of lesser rank face him, and between them is a vessel shaped much like the one on which they are depicted. It is filled with a foaming liquid, probably made of honey or cacao. The depiction of the luxurious life of a wealthy and powerful young man is overlaid with references to death, as this vessel is undoubtedly a mortuary offering. On the left, we see a plate with a trumpeter. One variety of Maya polychrome ceramic vessel is a plate or a shallow bowl that's decorated with a central figure framed by a band of repeated motifs. This example features an elaborately costumed musician with a long wooden trumpet pressed to his lips. The many depictions of musicians and the survival of numerous types of musical instruments indicate that music played a role in Maya ceremony and celebration. Although the only clothing this figure wears is a short elaborate tunic with a goggle-eyed mask at the back of the waist, he is decorated by an abundance of feathers and body paint. The L-shaped glyph block incorporated above the, above the figure's face is not readable. The so-called codex style vessels, such as this example, are named for the painting technique the dark line on cream-colored ground that visually resembles that of the Maya codices or manuscripts. The codices were almanacs and most were destroyed by the Spanish invaders. The elaborate multi-figured narrative on this ceramic vase is mythological and believed to depict a scene in the Maya underworld. 
Here the catfish barbelled god called Chalk swings a long-handled axe above a baby jaguar deity on a kakwar throne. On the opposite side of the altar, a skeletal death god, God A, joins in the dance while two others, a nefarious dog and a firefly holding a cigar, look on. Although other kinds of narratives appear on Maya vessels, supernatural scenes such as this one are particularly appropriate because these vessels were placed in tombs and filled with provisions for the journey of the deceased into the underworld. The image on this ceramic vase displays a mastery of fine line painting with an exuberant use of whiplash line and an attention to detail that includes the dust kicked up by dancing feet. Cooking and serving vessels for the Maya, such as these, were sculptural with minimal or no painting. The tripod bird bowl on the left is nine and a half inches tall. It's a favorite vessel type of the Maya lowlands made in the shape of a bird, perhaps a cormorant, in the act of catching a fish in its beak. Details of the bird are rendered on the lid where its head forms the knob and its wings spread out onto the expanse of the lid. The fish is rendered three-dimensionally, carefully held in the wide bird beak. The bowl beneath the lid forms the body of the bird. In monochrome versions of the theme as seen here, details are incised. In polychrome examples, they are multicolored. The symbolic meaning of the theme is not clear, even though it remains constant on the lids of a number of different bird bowl types, from those without feet to four-footed examples. As these bowls have been found in some burials, the theme may relate to death and or the afterlife, or more simply to the presumed contents of the vessel. The tetrapod bowl on the left measures five and a half inches tall, Wide mouth bowls or plates are believed to have been used as presentation or serving vessels. Those raised on four bulbous feet are identified with the Maya lowlands of Mexico and Guatemala in the earliest centuries CE and include a rather showy surface with an arresting bright red orange slip as seen here. The surface is continuous, even, and smooth in color. The shape is clean lined and well balanced. This type of vessel represents a considerable display of proficiency in art and technique. These were valued as precious objects at the time of manufacture. Other ceramics of specialized shape and size were finished with the same orange red surface color. This example has dark gray firing clouds on the bottom of the feet. The only change in color from smooth orange red on the vessel. Fire clouds are um, reduction, local reduction spots from the open pit fire. Our last images today depict figurative sensors. On the left is a seated figure from the fourth century, perhaps a fourth century Maya king. This incense burner would have been used to make offerings carried by smoke to the spirits and deities in the supernatural realm. Rulers are represented in Maya art as communicators with the supernatural, and the living may have sought their continued intervention after death. The use of censors bearing the royal image may have enforced the belief that when a ruler died, he became divine. This censor is composed of two parts, the base in which the incense burned, and the chimney decorated with the image of the Maya Lord. On the right, we have a sensor, another sensor with seated figure. This one is 14 and a half inches tall. The one on the left was 33 inches tall. So this one is about half that size. Sensors have been discovered in a wide range of contexts from the steps of temples to cave interiors indicative of the importance of burning rituals in ancient Mesoamerica. It's thought that billowing clouds of smoke produced by the burning of copal incense accompanied every major ceremony in the Maya realm. Depicted on this censer on the right here, a seated figure, perhaps a ruler, 
is surrounded by aspects of mythological creatures stacked about his head and symmetrically flank his sides. The central figure is in higher relief, sitting cross-legged with arms carefully positioned in front of his chest. The position of the hands, held inward and touching, is known from sculpted stone monuments where it carries connotations of rulership. A human head or mask-like element is depicted in the figure's lap. This is thought to represent a generalized concept of a revered ancestor. Our next lecture, lecture seven, will be on the golden age of Islamic and Chinese ceramics from 1000 to 1400 CE. And if you wanna read ahead, here are some pages in Cooper and Staubach. Also, uh, please look up the Jene culture and the Caduan culture online. Thank you.